we're going to turn to Ben Moody. Um, we'll see when he gets uh, promoted here. Um, yeah. Title, there we go. The title of Ben's <laughs> presentation, Implications of the Consol Consolidation of the Civic Space on Environmentalism in Russia. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, okay, so as the title of my paper would uh, indicate, I'm going to be talking about sort of the intersection between this, the consolidation of the civic space and specifically how it's impacted the, envir the environmental movement um, in Russia. Um, so moving on to my first slide here, um, sort of an overview of how my paper was structured. Um, what I what I noted um, initially was that since taking office in 2000, Putin has done a very remarkable job in consolidating his so-called power vertical. Um, and as part of this, um, he's really clamped down on civil society um, through several sort of um, both formal and informal means. Um, and I wanted to look at how this has specifically impacted the environmental sector. Um, so my paper is divided largely into four parts, and I'll divide my presentation that way as well. Sort of a theoretical overview, looking at different forms of resource mobilization theory. Um, and how this relates to environmentalism, then sort of a brief overview of Putin's consolidation of civil society, um, then how this has impacted environmentalism in model, modern Russia, and then a brief case study. Um, so, um, sorry, moving, sorry, I'm trying to, next slide, okay. <laughs> um, so moving on to my theoretical and historical background. Um, in my initial research, I relied a lot on the, a book by a University of Oregon scholar, Jane Dawson, called Eco-Nationalism anti-nuclear activism and national identity in Russia, Lithuania, and Ukraine. Um, and when reading this book, I thought it was really smart how it divided, it used, it used different forms of research mobilization theory divided into two parts. First is more of a utilitarian approach, talking about what resources groups have access to and how this impacts how they're able to organize and what they organize around, and also sort of identitarian based approaches based on how when you're organizing in a group, what it says about your community, your nation, things like that, things that bring people together. Um, and she frames it sort of through a look at the late 1980s and 1990s, um, looking at how the environmentalism, the environmental movements in um, the late 1980s and the Soviet Union sometimes served as a stand in for broader um, grievances regarding overreach of the central government, um, drives for you know national independence and things like that, specifically um, various anti-nuclear movements. I have an image there of the Ignalinas, um, um, atomic energy station in Lithuania, and there were several protests against this um, atomic energy station. Um, you know, it started out as sort of an environmental thing. You're afraid of the potential in impacts of like nuclear contamination on the country, but then it broadly turned into more of a nationalistic movement. People are using the Lithuanian flag, um, and you know, this in some ways contributed to the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, so, how does this manifest? Um, today and why is it still relevant to modern day Russia, um, sort of the core focus of my paper, looking at how the modern environmental movement sort of has some of these same elements where it can serve as a stand in. Um, she talked about movement surrogacy where groups coming together to advocate for environmental issues in their community can serve as a stand in for broader grievances and how Putin's sort of efforts to clamp down on civil society and environmentalism is a reflection of the understanding of the you know, multiple meanings that civil society can have. Um, so moving on sort of into the core of my paper, talking about the Russian state versus civil society. Um, I give a brief overview of sort of the lessons learned that Putin had during the early 2000s. You know, there were the explosion of color revolutions in places like Georgia and Ukraine, largely led by, you know, local activists, civic activists. And to Putin, um, this sort of demonstrated into many authoritarians, this demonstrated the ability of civil society to act as, you know, a threat to the consolidation of an authoritarian regime. Um, and in response to that, I think Putin did something so, so somewhat smart as he tried to reframe the definition of what civil society could be. He spoke about a civil society that's brimming with love for the country, a civil society that's not only in name, but in status and would do its job, not just for money, but put its soul into the efforts to right the wrongs. And I think this batter, battle for the soul of sort of the Russian people is going to crop up a bunch um, in my research and sort of the aims of different civil society movements. Um, and he operationalized this through a 2006 law on non-governmental organizations, um, which authorized the government to deny registration to any organization whose goals and objectives um, created a potential threat to the sovereignty, political independence, national unity, and cultural heritage of the Russian Federation. And there's a lot to unpack there, but I think it's interesting that it ties sort of cultural heritage, 
um, and a new care to citizens to specifically the security of the Russian state. Um, so a civil society organization that's sort of going against this, you know, prescribed definition of what that cultural heritage is, is posing a direct threat to the sovereignty and political independence, independence of Russia. And this will be used later on um, to help um, justify um, the various other actions that the government took. There was the creation of the public chamber in 2005, um, which was sort of a, it was created as a ostensibly independent watchdog of civil society organizations in Russia, but it also had the power to um, issue grants to NGOs. Um, and I looked at one study that's, um, illustrated how what this essentially did was it created sort of an us versus them dynamic where only certain groups had access to certain resources while others were left out. Um, and the groups that were left out were sort of systematically marginalized, just the things like um, increased audits, you know, searches of offices, things like that. Um, and I think it's interesting because it goes at both of those core sides. You know, you have the, they're cutting off resources so groups are not as effective, but they're also going at, you know, their very identity. Um, you know, certain groups are favored over others. Um, and I think this got even worse under the 2012 law on foreign agents, um, which, you know, allowed the governments to force groups to identify themselves as a foreign agents if they get funding from abroad um, and they carry out ac political activities with political activities um, very broadly described. And of course, labeling yourself as a foreign agent has a whole host of consequences beyond simply just, you know, not being in favor with the government and not having access to those networks and funding resources, but also it has that connotation of being sort of somewhat outside, being an alien, being a traitor. I have this image um, pulled from the Embassy International website, which I thought was pretty illustrative of this. Um, and this was expanded with the 2015 law on undesirable organizations, which went at those Western organizations um, who were providing funding to civic groups on the ground in Russia. Um, like my employer, the National Democratic Institute was uh, lumped in this, in this group. So, um, and then finally, I wanted to briefly talk about the Presidential Grants Foundation, which is sort of a successor to the, um, the public chamber. It's sort of a umbrella group allowing the Russian government to issue grants to civic civil society groups um, across 12 key um, issue areas. And I, what I found interesting about these 12 issue areas, which I won't get into all of them, is they're all very citizen focused. It's about promoting a healthy lifestyle, support for the family, cultural heritage. Um, and there was environment in there, but it's also about preservation of historical memory. It's not so much about civil society being a government watchdog. It's sort of using civil society to craft that sort of ideal Russian citizen. Um, and kind of interestingly too, it's called the Presidential Grants Foundation, even though it's just comes from the public budget. It's not Putin signing the checks, but it has this connotation in your head that Putin is the one that's, you know, the primary supporter of civil society. So um, with all that background, looking into the environmental movement, I wanted to see whether environmental groups have been lumped into the same sort of discussion about whether they're Russian, whether they're not Russian, um, whether they've been hit and impacted by these laws. Um, and I think what you see, um, in the, especially in the uh, post-Soviet period, is there's been an emergence of three different classes of environmental groups. Um, there's the professionalized civic groups. Um, you know, these are the ones that attract Western funding. Um, their staff is generally well-educated. They have international contacts, things like that. Um, and they see themselves largely as government. Their, their role as an environmental group is government and industrial oversight. Um, so there's a bit of an antagonistic relationship there, a natural one, where they're trying to hold the government to account in protecting their communities and the environment more generally. Um, then beyond that, you have government affiliates. Um, and these are sort of ones I've talked about, like things that are, get funding from the Presidential Grants Foundation um, or other government funding. Um, and instead of being having that antagonistic relationship with the government per se, they would be cooperating the government, you know, helping the government implement a law. Um, generally just working with the governments on different projects that they might, um, the government related to the environment that the government might be trying to implement. And then lastly, you have grassroots organizations, which are smaller scale, use lower cost um, mass mobilization techniques, you know, volunteer membership, things like that. Um, and each of these groups has been impacted differently by the changing civil society landscape in Russia, as I'll get into a little bit. Um, so the first group is the president, uh, sorry, it's the professionalized environmental groups. I have um, one image there, which is of the Baikal Ecological Wave, which will serve as my case study a little bit later. 
Um, as like I said, they focus they because they have these um, you know, well-educated professionals with Western context and they get Western funded, Western funding. They're largely focused on transnational issues or issues that um, get a little bit more international attention. This isn't always true, but it does tend to see to be a little bit more of a trend. Um, and I think what's most interesting is that these groups have been very heavily impacted by the foreign agents law. Um, I noted that in of the 158 groups designated as foreign agents in 2012, 29 or nearly 20% were environmental NGOs. And of course, this raises a puzzle. Why are the environmental groups being so heavily targeted? Um, like a human rights group you think might make sense, but why an environmental group? And I think to get to that, you really have to understand both the historical sort of implications of what environmentalism has meant in the Soviet and post-Soviet context, where it really has served as a stand-in for other issues, um, as well as just the general sort of aims of these professional groups of holding government to account, which of course goes against, you know, what an authoritarian regime might want if they're trying to protect their strategic or national interests. Um, I have a sort of mention there of the, the fifth column. This comes from a Putin quote where he talks about how there's the difference between true oppositionists who love their country and sort of fake oppositionists who only do the bidding of international donors. Um, and I think that what this does is it does a it creates that direct connection between whatever your funding is and what your ultimate aims are. And while there is certainly something to be said for your funding impacting what you prioritize, what Putin is saying that you're only doing the bidding of them and you're not actually Russian, you're some sort of foreign group just because you get that foreign funding. And he specifically po pointed to environmentalists and environmental groups at times as of sort of comprising this fifth column or being traitorous. Um, so moving on, just given how there's a declining space for professionalized environmental groups to operate now because many of them have been shut down or have you know been impacted severely by the foreign agents law. In contrast, there's been increasing space for sort of government affiliated groups to um, take the forefront. Um, I point to a couple in my paper. First is VOOP, um, probably just VOOP. It's the All Russian Society for Natural Protection. Uh, this is a very old group. Um, but they largely sort of work with the government on a lot of the things I already talked about. I point to a few of their projects in my paper, and I think what's really interesting is their their products are also very citizen focused about, it's not just so much about environmentalism, but it's also about sort of crafting the ideal Russian citizen or preserving that cultural memory. Um, there's one that's planned for, I think March to September of this year, at least was, I'm not sure what's going on in the COVID context. Um, that was called Great Victory and Great Spring, which um, it was about, it was a celebration of the history of the great victory of World War II and tying this to help citizens understand that, you know, we can come together to protect our environment, just like we came together previously um, to help, you know, protect against the Nazis. Um, and a lot of their projects have that same sort of like social, socially conscious element to them. Um, I also looked at the Presidential Grants Foundation, um, their environmental grants, uh, specifically in the first competition of 2020. Um, I looked at 92 of the grants. Each of them has to provide some sort of social justification for um, why their project is important. And I found that of the 92, at least 71 mentioned changing citizens' cultural or moral attitudes as a primary social goal or just general goal of the project. Um, there was a project in Moscow on stray animals, which talked about how it will contribute to the moral education of the children and contribute to the future of the country. Another one about a spring in Belgorod Oblast talked about the preservation of culture traditions in the countryside and the increase of patriotism among young people. And what I think is really interesting about this um, is just because all of these projects are so citizen focused and don't really have much to say about what the government is doing specifically, it seems to place a lot of the responsibility for taking care of the environment solely on the citizens. It's the citizens' moral attitude that needs to change a lot of the projects point to polling where you know citizens say that they don't understand why the guts they they don't think that it's their responsibility to care for the government they think it should be the government's um and they point to this as a bad thing and while it's certainly admirable to want to sort of build in citizens this idea that they should be taking care of their environment as more professionalized or more independent groups are diminishing in number because of this these actions taken to constrain their operations it leaves the only real space for environmentalism to be this sort of citizen education, citizen drive. So the government's role in protecting the environment is largely forgotten or not as emphasized as much. Um, 
moving into the third class of environmental movements. And unfortunately, this wasn't as large of a focus of my, as my, of my paper, um, but with the declining number of professionalized civic groups, sort of grassroots to local level um, protests and smaller scale like um, operations are emerging as sort of a last bastion for independent environmental advocacy in Russia. I point to an example of the Kimki protests, which was a protest against a forest um, in a suburb near Moscow, um, sort of served as a, a bunch of citizens got together, um, did repeated protests and succeeded in delaying, though ultimately not succeeding in um, preventing the building of a highway that would cut through the forest. Um, and I have a quote from one of the activists who participated in there in, in the movement, which I thought was very illustrative of how the ways that environmentalism can mean so much more. Um, she talked about how the Kimki protests sort of served as a starting off point for many activists demonstrating the power of citizens to stand up against the central government. She talked about how it could lead to a change in consciousness, which could lead a to a change in society. Um, and what I think this really gets at, and is kind of a key theme through a lot, a lot of my paper and a lot of just the activism I saw that is environmentally focused is by organizing to protect your community, even around an environmental issue, you sort of change the expectation um, of the citizen where you know they're taking charge and advocating for their rights, um, which is inherently a more democratic process. And you can see how that might be a threat to an authoritarian government. Um, if you look at sort of the, the evidence that Dawson talks about in the 1980s with the anti-nuclear movements, um, you see a lot of the same language about citizens coming together advocating against the center that they believe is somehow, you know, exploiting them, not hearing them, not take, um, taking into account their issues or their concerns. Um, so I think this is very re reveal re reveals why the environmental movement has been such a target of things like the foreign agents law. Um, I'm moving into my case study. I'll do this um, somewhat briefly because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, but I looked at one group in particular, which was the Baikal Ecological Wave, which I thought demonstrates sort of in microcosm the ways that Russian identity and shifting access to mobilization resources has affect, affected the operations of environmental groups. Um, so the Baikal Ecological Wave um, was founded in 1990. Um, as you would expect, it's about protecting um, Lake Baikal. Um, it's a more professionalized group. It's been able to secure Western funding from places like USA, the German Green Party, the Ford Foundation, and it also uh, attended international conferences. It has sort of that international connections to it. Um, so you can see that that would make it a more prime target for you know, later repression. Um, so what I think is interesting is the, the group throughout its history had sort of three or multiple um, notable um, clashes with the government. The first was over a Trans-Siberian oil pipeline. Um, you know, the state oil company Transneft in consultation, it was supported by Russian and uh, Moscow and environmental officials, was planning to build a pipeline that would have cut through the lake. Um, and Baikal Ecological Wave helped organize massive protests against it. And eventually even got Putin to intervene who sort of got out a map and drew a different route. Um, so, I mean, you can already see that there's this sort of tension and Putin's directly getting involved. Um, I think the, the founder who I have shown there, Marina Rikvanova, um, talked about how it actually revealed how the process should not work because it wasn't a democratic process that led to their eventual victory. It was just Putin drawing a line on the map. And the second and sort of most prominent case I point to was sort of saga of the Angarsk Nuclear Enrichment Center. Um, which was a group of protests that I call Ecological Wave organized against a planned um, international nuclear enrichment center um, in the city of Angarsk. Um, they called the project No Chernobyl on Lake Baikal, which of course calls back to some of those same protests I mentioned previously. Um, what was interesting is their protest attracted um, a group called Autonomous Action, which heavily took part in the protests, um, which describes itself as an anti-fascist um, sort of anarchist, anti-authoritarian group. Um, and this sort of probably contributed to what eventually ended up happening, which were when these protesters were asleep at night, they were attacked by masked men. Um, one of them was beaten to death. Um, and it was revealed the government arrested a few pe people that it was ultranationalist skinheads that were you know, leading the protest, one of which actually turned out to be Marina Rikvanova's son, um, which, you know, 
obviously it raises a whole bunch of questions. Um, her theory was that somehow the security services um, infiltrated some alternationalist group, convinced her son to take part in this protest to discredit her and her organization. And this was, you know, a full five years before the foreign agent law had even passed. Um, and I think this sort of gets at the many levers that the central government could pull to discredit groups that it sees as threatening. Um, finally, there was a protest that they organized against the Baikal paper, pulp and paper mill. I won't get into it too much, but this was ultimately sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, it was specifically cited by the government when um, Baikal Ecological Wave was declared for an agent in 2013, and the group was ultimately forced to close in 2015. Um, so just getting at sort of general conclusions um, from all of this, I think Generally, what has happened is Putin is in his administration have taken several steps to operationalize his, you know, ideal vision of civil society. One that's really citizen focused about sort of keeping citizens aligned within this context of building love for the country. Um, and this has impacted environmentalism because in many ways, environmentalism can serve as a stand in for citizens sort of taking, taking charge and advocating for their rights and their communities um, sort of against the central government. Um, and as you can see, you know, the Russian government has been able to attack both the identities of these groups, painting them as traitors, and also, you know, their ability to conduct operations by directly um, getting at their ability to secure funding and things like that. Um, and lastly, I sort of leave off saying that maybe grassroots activism will provide a continued pathway for activism moving forward. And I think that would be a very rich um, object of study. So thank you. <laughs> That was great. Thank you, Ben. That's a really important topic. And you're right, kind of ties in some nice historical parallels to the late Soviet period. Um, so at, while you stop screen sharing, I'm going to turn to Professor Stent. <laughs> we have questions uh, on the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. That, again, was tremendously informative. And I think you really covered a lot of important angles. So as you say, um, to some extent, the Putin administration has co-opted some environmental groups uh, and under the rubric of being patriotic and love of country, as long as they operate within certain constrictions set obviously by, by the Kremlin. Um, in your research, would you say there are any environmental projects per se that are considered more politically threatening to the Kremlin than others? Or is it really the nature of the group and the extent to which they uh, link up with foreign groups? I'm thinking about things like Greenpeace, the Russian version, but then there's obviously an international version of it too. So is it, is it the project per se, or is it more just the links that these groups have had that determines whether they are able to operate fairly independently? I thought you made a very important parallel, uh, which was to the anti-nuclear movement of the Soviet era because if you were in a Soviet-backed anti-nuclear group where you mainly criticized the United States, that was fine. If you were in an anti-nuclear group that criticized both sides, then that wasn't fine. Um, yes, um, so I think generally what I saw was it's kind of a combination of both. If you have those sort of more developed connections with Western institutions, you're of course are going to get attention of the, the government a little bit sooner, but I think Largely what I saw is a lot of the groups, the justifications for um, their being declared a foreign agent were tied to specific activities they had conducted. Um, one group um, conducted advocacy against a nickel plants in a community. Um, I think by call ecological wave, they were targeted because, I mean, obviously they had those international connections, but also that by call pulp and paper mill. Um, was a prominent industrial in, in, um, interest in that community. Um, and when they were declared a foreign agent and when that well, going back, they successfully were able to advocate for that mill to be closed and the government did close it. But what I found interesting is at the time when that mill closed, every, everything in the press was about how, you know, all the people that worked at that mill were going to be out of work. It was going to impact them economically. Um, and Putin himself had, had previously intervened into the um, operations of that mill, allowing them to, you know, pollute more to um, help sort of buttress their economic situation. So when they were ultimately forced to close, I think just having that previous conflict with the industrial interests of the Russian government, I think, you know, placed them primarily in the crosshairs, but it is sort of a, a combination of both. Thank you. 
Great, from Amber, um, the 29, th thinking, speaking about the 29 environmental NGOs designated as foreign agents, did you come across how this compares to other types of NGOs and were they hit harder? Um, I mean, I think from what I saw, um, the research I found, I, human rights groups were obviously, I think, hit the hardest of all the groups. Um, women's groups are also targeted. Um, I just found it interesting that you know such a high percentage were environmental groups. I, I think primarily the focus was on you know democracy organizations or government watchdog organizations and things like that. So human rights groups were definitely hit the hardest um, early on. Um, but I, I, it, I, some of the same language that was used to go after these human rights groups was also used to go after environmental groups. Um, um, and from Professor Smith, hi, Ben. One difference from the period Dawson wrote about is the rise of a private sector. How is Russian corporate funding playing a role in growing a specifically Russian environmental sphere? Um, so I didn't look as much at the private sector, um, but what I did find is a lot of those sort of more government affiliated groups would work directly with um, industries in their region. Um, like if the government passed like a, um, a new law or a new like regulation it would be the job of these government affiliated NGOs to sort of help them um, to live up to these um, these this the, the letter of the law um, they would collaborate more specifically with industrial interests in their community um, but yeah I think that would be something to look more at specifically is how private funding has played a role I was mostly looking at government funding okay um, from Professor Sabonis Health Ben that was fascinating are there any national level environmental issues on which the Russian government has changed its approach, even if it rejects the civil society push to do so? Um, I mean, I think, I don't know, I think maybe global warming is an interesting one to look at. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, I think Putin and his government was much more dismissive of it. I think there's been a little bit of a shift in the last few years, maybe recognizing that it can be a potential problem in um, you know, Putin now agreeing to several international agreements regarding global warming. Um, so yes, I think that's the case. Um, I, I, what I found somewhat surprising is Putin's willingness to intervene directly into specific environmental issues. Um, you know, the ones that I was talking about with my colleague, Ecological Wave, like him coming in and drawing a different line on the map based on their advocacy. Um, I think there's some willingness um, on the part of the central government if there is sort of a, a movement um, to take action in response, but I think it's it's not really in a democratic manner where it's more just the central government decides um, and it moves from there, it goes very top down, um, which obviously isn't the ideal way of doing it. It's not going through democratic channels. Mm -hmm. um, from Ava, are all the environmental organizations you look into single issue organizations or do they also try to raise awareness of other issues? Also, do they have an international agenda to it, to raising awareness of issues outside of Russia or support for Fridays for Future Movement, et cetera, for example? Um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily single issue um, organizations. Um, Baikal Ecological Wave obviously is focused on you know, protection of Lake Baikal, but they were connected to general environmental movements across the world. They would participate in national conferences and talk about, you know, they would talk about how they're the best practices for sharing for protecting the environment in this area could apply to a different area. I looked at one um, group which had created sort of a map of different grassroots um, activities going on throughout Europe and including Russia um, and sort of, you know, worked with them to create sort of, um, you know, connections between different groups internationally. Um, so. Great. Um, from Jordan Beckenstein, besides the economic impact of the closure of the Baikal plant, it was also reopened because of the direct intervention of Oleg Didipaska. Can you speak to the role of oligarchs in official approaches to ENGOs? Um, so, yes, I mean, I think this kind of gets at what I was talking about earlier, where it's not just, you know, it's not proceeding necessarily through democratic channels, but there are, you know, the central government can get involved or prominent individuals can get involved and they can take action in a particular direction on an environmental issue. So it's very much sort of a top-down um, approach and it's based on the connections that you already have. Um, so like obviously an oligarch would have greater connections with the government to push forward a change um, and on a particular issue, but maybe a group that's been ostracized as a foreign agent wouldn't have the same, the same ability to do that. Um, so they would have to use some sort of other means to get the attention they would need. Um, yeah. Fabulous.
Well, that's perfect timing, exactly 2.30. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you.